I am Dr. Jitesh Kaur Ganewa from the Department of Art History and Visual Arts, Punjab University, Chandigarh. Today we look at the Bengal School of Painting. The Bengal School of Painting marks one of the most prominent art movements in early 20th century that sought to evolve a modern Indian art that would derive from the glorious Indian artistic traditions of the past. The factors that played a role in the emergence of this style from scholars such as E.B. Havel, A.K. Kumaraswamy, and Kakuzo Okakura, and the growing nationalist sentiment are examined here. The seminal role played by Abhinandana Tagore as an ideologue and an artist is studied in detail. A brief overview is given of his students through whom the manner spread to different parts of the country. The 18th century marks the period when the West woke up to the Eastern aesthetics of art as scholars like Sir Alexander Cunningham and James Ferguson with their survey of monuments of the ancient and medieval India brought Indian art to sharper focus in Europe. The formation of the Asiatic Society of Bengal in 1784 and Archaeological Survey of India 1861 and publication of the reports helped in generating an understanding and appreciation of Indian art in both Europe and India. Thus, Indian art started getting recognition for its beauty and the ideals of its inspiration. The 18th and 19th centuries are also the period when the art practiced in India was going through major changes. The new inquiries into Indian art also sparked the interest of many Indian intellectuals towards their art and heritage, resulting in a fresh approach in not only viewing the art of the past, but also in attempting to create new works based on its essence. The emergence of the Bengal school with the works of Abhinandana Tagore was significant for Indian art, especially painting, and is considered to be the first phase of modernism in 20th century Indian art. Even as the appreciation of Indian artistic traditions grew, it was essentially the craft traditions of the country that garnered wider appreciation and not so much the fine arts. Indian crafts gained appreciation in the West for their delicate designs. Scholars like John Ruskin, in a lecture delivered at the Kensington Museum in January 1858 said, I suppose none in their kind more admirable than the decorated works of India. They are indeed in all materials capable of color, wool, marble or metal almost inimitable in their delicate application of divided hue and fine arrangement of fantastic line. Appreciation from scholars like Ruskin kindled interest of the West in Indian artistic traditions and the need to preserve these craft traditions became the basis of the establishment of art schools across the subcontinent by the British. The new developments in the course of modern Indian art were also in part due to these schools of art. Now we'll briefly look at the establishment of schools of art and craft. In Madras Presidency City, the first school of art was established in 1850. The surgeon, Dr. Alexander Hunter, founded two separate schools in fact, one for fine arts and the other for industrial arts in 1850 and 51 respectively. These schools were soon merged in 1852 and were known as the Government School of Industrial Arts and Dr. Hunter ran this institution until 1870. Eventually, it was named the Government College of Arts and Crafts. Dr. Hunter was often consulted for advice on establishment of similar institutions in the country. Likewise, in Calcutta too, the Government School of Art and Craft was founded in 1854. This school was established by the Society for the Promotion of Industrial Art to encourage and promote industrial arts in the region. The school later played an important role in the development of an Indian modern art or what came to be known as revivalism. Besides this, the Sir JJ School of Art was established in 1857 in Bombay and in North India, the Mayo School of Arts was founded in Lahore in 1875. These schools of art were essentially established to promote the industrial arts or crafts of India which had a huge market in Europe, especially in Britain. Despite such a mandate, the Indian traditions and art were ignored in these schools, largely due to the dogmatic opinion prevalent 
among the administrators who were convinced of the inferiority of Indian art compared to Western academic art. By the end of the 19th century, prominent art schools in the subcontinent had started to influence the course of art by imposing Western art education and aesthetics on the arts of India. Now we'll briefly look at the influential educators and scholars who played a role in the emergence of the Bengal school. Among the British art educators, there were a few who spoke up about the validity of the Indian artistic traditions and opposed the thoughtless imposition of an alien aesthetic. Scholars like J.L. Kipling, and E.B. Hamill, associated with the schools of art, took up writing on the subject. Their writings were published in journals and newspapers, which were read by the British and also by a section of educated Indians. Kipling was appointed Professor of Architectural Sculpture at the New School of Art at Bombay and shifted to India in 1965. In his capacity as the principal of the art school, Kipling became a man of detailed observation realized the value of Indian crafts which were on the path of decay. Opposing the mindless copying of Victorian art, Kipling encouraged Indian artisans to take inspiration from their own traditional crafts and design. E.B. Havel was another such critic of English descent who had a great influence over the contemporary art ideology in early 20th century, especially in Calcutta. As he was the principal of the School of Industrial Arts in Calcutta from 1896 to 1908, he was in a position to effectively influence the budding artists from the region. Tapati Guha Thakurta maps the journey Havel took from being a champion of Indian design and crafts to an ideologue of Indian fine arts. In her opinion, one of the clearest manifestations of this lay in his acquaintance with Mughal miniatures, some choice specimens of which were acquired by him for the government art gallery in the late 1890s. Havel not only encouraged the revival of Indian art, but also appreciated Indian art from its own standpoint rather than measuring it against Western parameters and equated it with the higher qualities of imagination and spirituality. He was one of the pioneers to recognize the need to evaluate merit of traditional Indian art independent of Western norms. Western art of the times was going through radical changes especially after the Impressionist Revolution and rejection of classical canons as a measure of good art, which encouraged critics like Havel to view the ancient art of India with new eyes. Working at the art school and his interaction with artists outside placed Havel in a position to directly influence artists to look towards their roots to determine the future of their art. Havel was well acquainted with the writings of Okakura and agreed with his perception of superiority of Asian art to that of Western art. This reversed the established criteria of judging art and of establishing its value and it gradually made an impression on the minds of early 20th century Indian scholars. It is interesting to also note that Havel became to Abhinandanath Tagore what Ernst Fenolosa was to Okakura. Together, they founded similar values among the artists of Bengal. A.K. Kumaraswamy was a leading exponent of the defense of Indian aesthetics and was committed to rewriting Indian art history. He is also considered the father of art criticism in India. He, along with Havel, highlighted an exclusive aesthetic philosophy of Indian art. They saw Indian art as a vehicle for the conveyance of great spiritual truth. His writings on Indian art of contemporary times also had great impact on the modern art in the country. Critical of Ravi Verma's want of imagination, of the lack of an Indian feeling in his Indian subjects, and accusing his gods and heroes of being anything but godly and heroic, Kumaraswamy, along with other Orientalists and nationalists, established a new code for modern Indian art, or what may be termed an artistic revival in modern India. 
with importance given to moral, idealism, emotion and expressiveness, the Indian style painting of Abhinindranath Tagore and his students such as Nandlal Bose fulfilled these norms. Now we we'll look at briefly the impact of nationalism on the art movement. Another factor that played a role in the look back to traditions and the emergence of revivalism was the growing nationalist sentiment in the country that had begun to pervade most aspects of life, art being one. Now, thinking artists began to look to return to their roots when it came to art and its practice. Influenced by the social reforms which started from Bengal, it can be seen as a natural development that the propagation of art based on a nationalist Indian ideology was fast growing in popularity amongst the scholars and artists who supported this trend. Sister Nivedita was another force to reckon with during this period of reawakening. Nivedita or Margaret E. Noble, a disciple of Swami Vivekananda, came to India in 1898. Assessing her role, Tapati Guha Thakurta credits her writing with providing the most significant alignment of Hindu revivalist ideology with an assertive nationalism in the evolving discourse on Indian art. Sister Nivedita, who had been a revolutionary leader in the Swadeshi movement, through her writings upheld art as the most important vehicle of nationality and of the creation and propagation of a new national art. And the latter she was to do through championing the paintings of Abhinandana Tagore and his disciples. Her association with the Tagores in Calcutta worked as an instrument to influence artists of the Bengal school. Now we look at the beginnings of the Bengal school of painting. In the first decade of the 20th century, the effect of these scholars and the national sentiment started to become visible in the works of the artists, especially from Bengal. Abhinandana Tagore had been deeply involved in this transformation and became a torchbearer for this approach. Tagore's creative ideologies were mainly influenced by his peers, E.B. Havel, Sister Nivedita, Okakura and Kumar Swami. Their writings on art had sown the seeds of Swadeshi art. On the other hand, Tagore himself was a scholar of art and wrote on aesthetic theories published as Bageshwari, Shilpa, Prabandhavali and Shadhang or Six Limbs of Indian Painting and contributed effectively towards the development of modern Indian art through his writings in journals such as Rupak and his practices. He helped to define the premise of the Bengal School of Painting. Sandeep Sarkar states that Abhinandana Tagore was able to break through this oriental aesthetics and that his works became spontaneous expression. Abhinandana Tagore was the nephew of Abhinandana Tagore and the youngest son of Gunendra Tagore. Born at Jorashanko, the residence of the Tagore family in Calcutta on August 7, 1871, Abhinandana, it seems, was destined to pioneer the movement of modern art in India. Abhinandranath's father and uncle, Gunendranath and Jyotindranath, had joined the art school at Calcutta in 1864 and studied there for two years. Coming from a family well versed in literature and fine arts, it was a natural progression for young Abhinandranath to show interest in the arts. As a child, he learned to use his father's paint box and drew pastoral scenes, objects and palm trees. Even as a child, he was sensitive towards nature and developed great intimacy with plants and animals. He studied Sanskrit in the Sanskrit College at Calcutta from 1881 to 1890. This developed his interest towards understanding Shastras, which later helped him to give form to a nationalistic ideology in his artistic works as well. Along with his formal education, Abhinandanath received drawing lessons from one of his classmates, Anukul Chatterjee, and later on, he also took private lessons from two artists, Ogil Hardy from 1891 to 92, and Charles Palmer, the first an Italian and the other an Englishman. Gilhardi was the vice principal of the Government School of Art at Calcutta, whereas Palmer had been a professor at the Kensington Art School. Ogilhardi taught Tagore pastels, 
and from Parma he learned to use oils while painting in an academic manner. Abhinindranath's works can be divided into chronological phases. His first phase was the period of Western training when he worked on the medium of oils and pastels, did still lifes and also mythological paintings in a Ravi Verma style realism. Abhinindranath painted a lot of portraits during his first phase in the academic style, mostly in pastels. However, he did not find satisfaction in this style and it often showed in his works as he did not follow the established conventions in his paintings. Abhinindranath did not agree with the idea of drawing from life and had refused Palmer more than once during his classes. However, Abhinindranath continued to be influenced by some of the European elements in painting, even in his later works. He adopted certain attitudes from Western art, such as the interest in surface texture, at times the use of tempera almost in the manner of oils, differentiation of color planes with important elements put forward in a theatrical manner. He also imbibed the love for light and shade, structuralization of form and a love for individualized portraits. Portraits as a theme is not seen much in the Bengal school but it remained of great interest to Abhinindranath. Minuteness of details in depiction of drapery, hair and other similar elements is also an influence carried down from the European art classes that he took in his early phase as an artist. His next phase of painting began when he was presented with an album of Irish illuminated manuscripts in which the decorative designs influenced him. Around the same time, he was also given a portfolio of paintings of the Delhi Kalam. He realized that though they both belonged to two absolutely different traditions, yet there was a commonality of spirit and a sense of decorative design in both. From here began his conscious experiment with an Indian style, as seen in the work Shukla Abhisar, an illustration for a few lines of a Vaishnava Padavali by Govind Das. Scholars are of the view that this work shows more the influence of European illuminated manuscripts than the Indian miniature painting tradition. The figure exhibits an awkwardness of anatomy. In the rendering, there is a tremulousness in line. This was followed by a set of miniatures on passages from the Geet Govind, referred to as the Krishna Leela pictures. Even as his work moved decisively towards a style more reflective of the Indian miniature painting tradition, Ratan Parimu is of the view that the stylization of form in these early works is derived from pre-Raphaelite and Arch Nouveau paintings of Europe. This is clearly visible in two works on Kalidas's Ritu Samhar. Of these, Abhisarika, is the embodiment of a literary mood and sentiment. The figure, more distinct, is placed against a dark amorphous background. Tapati Guha Thakurta states that even though the westernized flavor remains somewhat, yet its combination of a naturalistic appearance with contoured body lines, elongated fingertips, gesticulating pose and flowing drapery would set the standard of the new Indian style painting. In these paintings, we can see a syncretism when he's trying to consciously mix the two aesthetics of the East and the West. Meanwhile, in 1897-98, Abhinindranath met E.B. Havel, who had the foresight to see Abhinindranath as an important figure with the potential to influence the course of modern Indian art. Abhinindranath Tagore, by the last decade of the 19th century, also met scholars Kumaraswamy and later on Okakura, who further shaped his art as he entered the next phase of his career as an artist. Both Havel and Kumaraswamy helped Abhinindranath understand and appreciate his rich artistic heritage 
and sowing the seeds of the Bengal school. Havel introduced Abhinandanath to Mughal, Pahari and Rajasthani miniatures. In them he found a great delicacy, sense of design and composition. The influence of Mughal painting on his work is quite evident, particularly in the format and style and similarity in the borders that he gave to his paintings. His line is subtle and there is emphasis on silhouette. This is visible in his Taj trilogy, which include the passing of Shah Jahan that won a silver medal at the Delhi Darbar exhibition in 1902. The building of the Taj. and Shah Jahan dreaming of the Taj. These works mark a shift in his work with colour now becoming the vehicle of expression. Thus, at this point, he was influenced not only by late medieval miniatures but also by Indian, Sanskrit, in Bengali literature as it was a period of revival of Bengali culture and literature. He studied a lot of works of Bengali writers and poets like Bankip Chandra Chatterjee and others. This period saw Abhinandanath achieve maturity of ideas. Abhinandanath met Okakura, a Japanese artist and scholar in 1902. Okakura had authored a book titled Ideals of the East and was a guest of the Tagores in Calcutta. He was a strong advocate of a pan-Asian aesthetic. The growth of nationalism had resulted in a view that one should look to the East for inspiration and not to the West. And this is the reason that the Tagores also became involved in the pan-Asian movement. Okakura, through his writings and ideas, became a major influence on the evolution of Abhinandanath's art. He also persuaded two Japanese artists Yokoyama Taika and Hishida Sunsho to come to India. The Japanese paintings opened Tagore's eyes to the beauties of nature. In Indian painting, landscape had primarily been a backdrop, whereas in Japanese painting, nature took center stage. With this new understanding, Abhinandanath started using landscape as an independent theme in his paintings. Possibly among the first Indian artists to paint landscapes, he did the early Puri and Konark landscapes in pencil, employing lyrical lines and shading. Later, the Sahajadpur, Mongia and Darjeeling landscapes were done in wash. From these Japanese artists, Abhinandanath learned the wash technique, which became a hallmark of his style. Interestingly, his wash and bath method is a synthesis of the Japanese wash and the European watercolour technique done on handmade paper. The Japanese painters used a flat brush dipped in water and ran it once or two times over the colours. This made the colour spread evenly and it remained luminous even after developing a softness. Whereas Abhinandanath preferred to dip the whole painting in water after the outlines were made. He applied colour washes and after each the paper was dipped in water and then as it dried the tones became darker, deeper and acquired a soft hazy look and became fixed. This also helped in achieving gradations of tones. This technique enabled a contrast of either very dark or very hazy tonality. A very precise technique, it gives no space for correction as the washes get fixed with every dip. At the end, the form would be defined with a few lines and highlights would be applied to model form and other details worked out. This technique became the identifying mark of Bengal school painters and became immensely popular between 1905 and 1940. It is due to Hevel's invitation to Abhinandana Tagore to join the art school at Calcutta in 1905 as a teacher in the Indian painting section that we today know the latter as the father of modern Indian art. 
armed with the knowledge of Indian literature and customs and modern education, Abhinandana Tagore was set to make more than a mark in the development of modern Indian art, especially by insisting that his students should have a sound knowledge of their own historic and artistic heritage. Along with applying his understanding and nationalistic ideology in his paintings, he also inspired and guided his fellow artists and students towards a similar approach in art. Abhinandanath worked on an extensive range of themes. For him, a theme was only a starting point to express a mood. He took inspiration from literature, epics and Indian history and his fascination with the Mughal period features in his work. In his paintings on Mughal subject matter, even the costumes are derived from that period. Romantic tales, portraits, landscapes, animal studies and themes from national life like images of leaders and personification of the motherland also interested him. The Swadeshi movement finally found him responding through Bharat Mata. A painting in which he evoked the image of Mother India, depicting her as both human and divine, with multiple arms and a halo. It is a symbolic image for which no prototype existed. Visualized as a young ascetic, she carries the blessings of food, clothing, learning and spiritual salvation, while white lotuses at her feet underline her divinity. The presentation gives her a mythic quality. In his works in the Bengal school idiom, the forms are enveloped in hazy tones that create a mood, usually pensive and introspective. Form is delicate and the space is ambiguous, as seen in works such as Diwali. The banished Yaksha Sita in captivity in Lanka. In a work such as The Journey's End, that depicts a weary camel lowering its burden. The colour tones of rust and orange establish the mood of the work, making it an allegory of the end or death. The fluid, delicate line further enhances the emotional and expressive quotient of the image, with touches of highlights adding to the impact. His paintings display refinement. The figures are naturalistic, but the mood is poetic. Colour is an important element in his paintings. His colour is fused with a tonal range that gives his paintings a lyrical charm and the expression of the mood. Colours are delicately harmonised and luminous. There is great variety in depiction of ornaments and costumes, which are detailed rather than suggested. They seem to envelop the figure. The figures are generally tall, elegant, shown with delicate hands and feet. Towards the later phase of work, the figures became squat and heavy. He signed his work in varied ways, such as in Persian, Devanagari, etc. In 1913, he was presented with a seal and stamped it as signature, and later from 1918 onwards, he started to use a seal with a Ganesh icon. By the 1920s and 1930s, his work reached its maturity. There appears a move towards a more narrative approach than the earlier emphasis on mood, expression and emotion. This can be seen in his Arabian Night series. Interestingly, in this, Jarashanko and its surroundings 
become the setting for these fantastical narratives. The architectural setting imparts a geometricity to the compositions, even as the artist seems to return to the depiction of details of figures, costumes and architecture reminiscent of his earlier focus on a miniature style. The compositions are more structured and greater definition is given to form and setting with the hues also brighter. These elements are visible in the hunchback of fishbone. and in Sinbad. Towards the end of the 1930s, after a gap of eight years, Abhinandanath returned to painting with a series on medieval balladic literature of Krishna Mangal and Chandi Mangal. In this last phase of activity, there is a turn towards an unsophisticated rustic idiom, something that had appeared in the works of Jami Roy as also Nandalal Bose as seen in his Haripura posters. With a simplification in the form, use of transparent watercolours and the Bengali script being employed for ornamental purpose. This is exemplified by his Balaram slaying Mushtika. Abhinandanath was trying to define a new aesthetic system derived from a synthesis of Western and Oriental sensibilities. His images are a result of an inner necessity. They are imbued with a poetic essence and he demonstrates the possibilities of a mixture of technique and mediums and of the fact that there is a concurrence of aesthetics of the East and the West, however opposed they appear superficially. He is criticized also, especially by W.G. Archer, that he was a weak draftsman and his lines are tremulous and also he did not have the technical capacity to use colours in a valid manner. However, in this regard, it needs to be considered that Abhinandanath is the product of his environment, his time and the family he comes from. In 1907, a group of enthusiasts of Indian art set up an organisation called the Indian Society for Oriental Art. Here Abhinandanath Tagore and Gagnandanath Tagore took classes and taught art in an informal way. Eventually, Abhinandanath also started to accept regular students and some of his students who gathered around him were Asit Kumar Haldar, Nandlal Bose, Shitindranath Majumdar. This was the heyday of the wash technique. They exhibited together in Paris in 1914 and there they were given the title of the School of Calcutta. Besides, training artists keeping in mind traditional aesthetics of India. Abhinandanath and other Indian art enthusiasts started influencing a large segment of art appreciators by writing in Bhupa, a journal started by the society. Now we'll briefly look at some of his students. Besides Abhinandanath, Asit Kumar Haldar was another artist of the Bengal school who deserves a brief mention as he carved a niche for himself, not only in India, but his paintings were noticed internationally during exhibitions. He was one of the most successful students of Abhinandanath Tagore. He initially started at the Calcutta School of Art under Abhinandanath and later followed his teacher's guidance in wash technique of painting. He also worked in Shantaniketan in 1911. From 1915 to 1919, he taught Indian painting at the Calcutta School of Art and took classes at the Indian Society of Oriental Art. Asit also briefly taught in the Jaipur School of Art and later went on to become the principal at the Lucknow School of Art. He wrote a number of articles and these were published in two journals, Prabashi and Bharati. While studying, he had been part of the team of students who went to Ajanta to copy murals and the influence is visible in his works such as Worship of Ashok Tree. Aldar made paintings as well as sculptures. He had learned to make sculptures from Jadupal, Bukeshwar Pal and Leonard Jennings. Aldar worked with a wide range of mediums, watercolours, tempera, lacquered painting on wood and also made frescoes. He worked on a wide variety of scenes 
from mythology, history and genre subject matter. His art is an imaginative art with figures and images drawn from the imagination that have emotional appeal and touch the mind of the viewer. He was a poet as well. And has translated works of Kalidas. Asat had a literary sensibility which is visible both in his poems and paintings. A large number of his works were made in series. For example, he painted 12 illustrations on the poems of Omar Khayyam, 32 paintings on Buddha, 30 episodes from Indian history. His style of painting was again poetic and lyrical. His works have a soft, delicate tonality and the lines are curving and have fluidity. His approach is literary as seen as works such as The Worshipper and Flame of Music. Another artist whose early career came to epitomize the characteristics of the Bengal school style is Nand Lalbos. Having studied under Abhinandana Tagore, he went to teach at the school at the Society of Oriental Art and later at the Kala Bhavan in Shantiniketan. His early works such as Sati, Shiva drinking the world's poison and Parthasarthi. are some examples that embody the principles of the Bengal school banner. In subject and content, a work such as Sati was read as a depiction of the ideal Indian woman encapsulating qualities of stoicism and sacrifice. The emphasis on emotive qualities and lyricism of form are seen in his Shiva drinking the world's poison. This evocation of Bhav Vyanjana in these paintings is what was most eulogized about the work of the Bengal school artists. But it was Nandlal's work after he came under the influence of Rabindranath Tagore, having joined the Kala Bhavan and also travelling with Gurudev to China and Japan in 1924 that widened his horizons as an artist, making him move towards a modernist, individualist expression. As K.G. Subramaniam states, that Shanti Niketan transformed Nandlal conclusively, weaning him away from Abhinandanath. In his early work, the technique was the wash method and later he went on to use tempera and gouache, moving away from the evocation of mood through washes of colour. His subject matter too shifted from the emphasis on symbolism and lyricism to themes taken from everyday life. Nandlal came to realize that art solely and wholly dependent on tradition becomes stiff. The other prominent artists of the Bengal school who were students of Abhinindranath Tagore, also known as Abhin Panthis, were K. Venkatappa, S. N. Gupta, Surendranath Kar and Mukul De among others. Abhinindranath students spread themselves all over India. Asit Kumar Haldar went to Lucknow, S. N. Gupta to Lahore, S. Day to Jaipur, Venkatappa to Mysore, P. Chatterjee to Baroda and so on. So by the 1920s, the Bengal school style was practiced all over India. Although it was known as the Bengal school style, but it was not confined to Bengal anymore. By the third generation of artists, the style became very repetitive and became more of a cliché. However, till about 1930, the Bengal school was the only style which found representation in exhibitions outside India. Critical of the term revival in describing the school, which in her opinion suggests a lack of originality, Jayapa Sami states, 
that the Bengal School of Painting ought to be seen as a bridge between traditional and modern Indian art. She credits Abhinandanath with opening the path for Indian artists to borrow freely from other art forms and aesthetic traditions and links it to the emboldening of the modern artists, allowing them to draw freely from foreign sources.